Okay, so in this video, we're going to talk about the propagation and conduction of action potentials, and we're also going to spend some time talking about graded potentials. So the first thing to talk about is that nervous impulses will travel from the trigger zone, and the axon hillock is our trigger zone for action potentials, all the way down to the axon terminals. So as the sodium ions come into the nerve cell body, basically you're going to get a change in membrane potential in the spots next to it that's going to move towards depolarization. In other words, from your resting potential of negative 70 up to your threshold at negative 55. And this will continue in sort of a domino falling pattern in one direction down the axons. So from the nerve cell body down to the nerve terminals. And so this is because of the pattern of sodium and potassium channels opening and closing and its relationship with refractory periods. So you'll recall the refractory period is the time during which the nerve cannot start another action potential. And so as one portion of the axon is undergoing its action potential, the previous segment is undergoing a refractory period and this keeps the uh, propagation one way down the nerve cell body, down in the nerve terminals, one way down the axon. Okay, so we're going to take a look at propagation of an action potential in both continuous conduction and in saltatory conduction. And if you'd like, it might not be a bad idea to revisit the action potential propagation video that you had a link to for test three. So on the left, we've got continuous conduction. Now this happens in unmyelinated neurons. So these are gonna be neurons that have got um, no, oligod no oligodendrocytes, no Schwann cells, no nodes of Ranvier, just a continuous axon going from the trigger zone, which is the axon hillock, all the way down to the axon terminals. So if you'll take a closer look at the very bottom left where this shows continuous conduction, you'll see those little circles with arrows there and those indicate the flow of sodium in and out. So you've got a current flow that is that the opening of sodium channels is actually responsible for. And so basically you've got the area where the sodium is coming in just ahead of that area. You're going to have where you're moving towards threshold. Just behind that area, you're going to have where a portion of the axon that's undergoing the refractory period. Okay, so if you move to five milliseconds, you've moved a little ways down the axon. So here, this area is moving towards threshold. Here, this area is letting sodium ions in. In this area, you've got a refractory period going on. And maybe back here, you've got an area where you can start a second action potential. At 10 milliseconds, again, same thing. In this area, you've got current flow in. In this area, you've actually got the sodium coming in. Okay, so this area is moving towards threshold. This area in action potential is beginning. Depolarization is beginning. Right here in this segment, you've got a refractory period. And then maybe again in this segment and all the way down, you can start another action potential. Okay, now let's take a look at saltatory conduction on the right. Now the first thing that I want you to notice is that there are um, myelinating cells and there are nodes of Ranvier. So here's what's happening. You have sodium inflow right here. That sodium is going to come in and actually diffuse underneath the cell. So that diffusion is going to happen very quickly. We'll see another animation of this later on. And at five milliseconds, you've reached the next node of Ranvier. And so right here, you've got inflow of sodium. That the sodium is going to flow in. It's going to go up underneath your myelinating cells. And so this is your current flow, which is going to lead to this area, this node of Ranvier, hitting threshold and having sodium inflow, and that sodium inflow will go down to the next node, 
and you're going to see that basically right here sodium inflow at this node of Ranvier and diffusion of sodium down in this direction okay and you can see here in this sort of blow up at the bottom that the sodium is going to come in and diffuse downward now when it now down here the leak channels are going to let it back out and so you're going to get this sort of current coming around like this so you've got a little bit of a current flow that's established here so this is saltatory conduction and like i said we'll go into that in more detail a little bit later on first let's kind of animate this a little bit i wanted to take those prior diagrams and sort of mash them together and show you what the action potential propagation looked like so at the top we've got the continuous conduction and you can just see one millisecond five milliseconds ten milliseconds so it moves continuously down the axon with the um, saltatory conduction you've got right now at one millisecond five milliseconds ten milliseconds and you can see already that this nerve impulse of this action potential is a lot further down the axon and that is because saltatory conduction happens a lot faster than continuous conduction okay so the next thing that we're going to look at is what's happening on the axon so let's take now, if you look at the bottom of this graph, you've got distance along the axon in millimeters. So you've got between millimeters two and three of the axon. So you've got sodium channels that are open in this one area. Downstream of it, in other words, to the right, you've got uh, sodium channels that are closed. Back to the left, you've got sodium channels that are inactivating. So this is basically what's happening. You've only got a small segment of the axon it's actually going through an action potential. And so with propagation, it's simply going to spread down the axon, okay? So if you look at the light gray area behind, so the white area is an action potential. If you look at the light gray area, this is going to be uh, entering an absolute refractory period and maybe moving to a relative refractory period. And then on the very left, you have an area of the axon where a second action potential can begin. Okay, so looking at this again. Okay, this uh, diagram we've already gone through, so I'm just going to skip ahead to the next uh, slide. So the next thing that we're going to take a look at is basically how some of these potentials can spread. So up at the top, um, as in a dendrite or the cell body, where you have graded potentials, you're basically going to have a stimulus, but that stimulus doesn't get renewed. It kind of it kind of fades away because sodium will come in at one specific point of the membrane, but that sodium entry won't get renewed. So let's take a look at this. So here's your point of sodium entry, and as sodium diffuses along the inside of the cell, the voltage size is just going to kind of fade out. So basically the voltage decays because current leaks across the membrane. The, the, remember that those leakage channels are going to try to be all, are always going to try to be removing these sodium ions. And so if you don't renew the stimulus, it's just going to die out over distance. Now in an unmyelinated axon, so this is the second one down, basically you have the point of sodium entry but this is going to move without loss of signal all the way down the axon because at intervals you've got voltage gated ion channels that keep renewing and regenerating that action potential all the way down the axon. Now this conduction is relatively slow because the ions moving and the um, opening and closing of the gates takes some time and it's got to occur before voltage regeneration can occur. Now in our third scenario here, in an unmyelinated axon, basically what the myelin does, so here with our myelinating cell and here, what it does is to insulate the membrane. And unlike here where, I'm sorry, unlike here where current can just leak out, there's no leakage of current out right here because Basically, your myelinating cells are going to be blocking those ions from leaking out of the membrane. Okay, so what happens here is that you get sodium entry at the point of the stimulus, and then it will diffuse down to the next node of Ranvier. 
So there's something that I need to discuss with y'all, and it's how fast that diffusion occurs on the molecular level. So when you see diffusion demonstrated, say, uh, I think I dropped uh, some dye in a large beaker, and you guys got to see that spreading out fairly slowly. But if you consider uh, how large or how small that those dye molecules were and how, how far they were traveling relative to their size, then I hope that you can understand that diffusion is a very fast process on the molecular level. So you'll have sodium diff um, come in to the cell and it will diffuse down to the next node of Ranvier and it'll happen very quickly. Now at the node of Ranvier, this is going to mimic an unmyelinated axon because the nodes of Ranvier are themselves unmyelinated. So you're going to see this impulse or you're going to see the spread of sodium ions go very fast underneath the, the um, myelinating cells. So again, that's going to be Schwann cells in the peripheral nervous system, oligodendrocytes in the central nervous system. And so watch this sort of motion. So the diffusion happens very fast underneath these myelinating cells and slower at the nodes of Ranvier. And that's the reason why it appears to sort of skip from node to node because the sodium ions diffuse underneath the myelinating cells so quickly. So the nodes of Ranvier, and this is a type of conduction called saltatory conduction, in which the nodes of Ranvier are the only points where depolarization occurs. So again, the nodes of Ranvier here, okay, and this is where depolarization occurs. Underneath here, you're not going to have any depolarization, and why not? It's because there are literally no voltage go to channels that are underneath um, these myelinating cells. So if a cell has been myelinated and it loses the myelination, it's going to have gaps in its membrane where there's actually no voltage-gated channels, but the uh, but you'll get leakage of the current out because there are still the leak channels there. So if you're myelinated, if you're myelinated nerve and you lose your myelination, you're going to, to um, lose function because in between this space here and this space here, enough sodium would leave the cell to not be able to trigger an action potential right here. So losing myelination is something that's absolutely devastating to myelinated nerves in terms of their ability to propagate action potentials. Okay, so again, here's the node of Ranvier, and here are the internodes, and remember the internode means between nodes, and so this is going to be the portion of the membrane that is underneath the myelinating cell. Okay. So when depolarization occurs at these nodes, you're going to get a current flow traveling down the interior of the axon. And so if you'll take a look at the sodium ion right here, then you're going to see it come in and travel um, down the interior of the axon. And when enough sodium ions reach the voltage-gated channels here, they're going to set off another action potential, and you'll get a continuous spread down to the next edge of the next myelinating cell and then sodium is going to uh, flow through in the same fashion. So again the internodal membrane, so the area underneath the myelinating cell between here and here, these myelinating cells wrap around the membrane tightly enough to prevent any current leakage and that allows the current to go really fast. Okay, now because depolarization only occurs at the nodes, and here's the first one here, the action potential appears to skip along the nodes. So you're going to see sort of the slow movement of the arrow uh, in the nodes of Ranvier, and that it appears to skip between the nodes. And again, it's because the diffusion of the sodium underneath the cells from here to here happens very fast. Let me see if I can actually draw an arrow. <laughs> Okay, now the current flow is in two directions, meaning that when sodium comes in here, it's going to spread in this direction, but it's also going to spread in this direction. And why doesn't it affect the prior node of Ranvier 
it's because the prior node of Ranvier is still in its refractory period. So let's say you have um, sodium come in right here. So sodium comes in. It diffuses down to this next node of Ranvier. So when this depolarization begins right here, then this node is actually going to be in its refractory period. And this keeps the signal moving in one direction down the axon. Okay, now because sodium is outside of the internodal membrane, so basically uh, what's going to happen here is you're going to have this sort of current flow um, on the outside. And so this sodium here, well, I think it's probably best that I just play the animation. So you'll see this current flow happening. Okay, so again, there's a current on the outside and sodium replenishment of the nodal region. So basically it means when sodium, uh, when sodium comes in, right here, where's the sodium to replace it going to come from? It's going to come from over here. So when the sodium rushes over here, like so, then it's in a position to be able to move in when the next action potential comes in. It'll then diffuse in this direction and then get pushed back out here by leak channels. So you have that constant current that goes on and this actually helps to speed up the action potential as it moves down the myelinated axon. Okay, so once you get to the end of the axon, what happens? So now we're going to talk about what happens at synapses, and this is going to be very similar to what happened at the neuromuscular junction uh, for your test 3 material. So hopefully this will seem um, pretty familiar. So the first thing that I need to do is to identify some of the things that are around here. So this area, this space is the synaptic cleft. Uh, each one of these sort of round containers here are synaptic vesicles. These are bubbles of membrane that actually contain neurotransmitters, which are in green dots. So here's what happens. First of all, the action potential arrives at the axon terminal. And so now we're going to have actually a new player here, a new membrane protein, and that's going to be voltage-gated calcium channels. Now, these calcium channels open in response to voltage, and they let calcium into the axon terminal. So you're going to see the, uh, so you're going to see the calcium actually moving in here. So calcium will move right in here. Now, when calcium moves in here, what it's going to do is it's going to cause the synaptic vesicles to release their contents by exocytosis. Okay, so they'll actually go down here and merge with a cell membrane. And then when they do that, your neurotransmitter is going to diffuse across and then bind to receptors that are on the postsynaptic membrane. And remember, this is your postsynaptic neuron. It's the neuron that's receiving signal. And this is your presynaptic neuron. It's sending signal. So again, the neurotransmitter diffuses across the synaptic cleft, binds to specific uh, receptors on the postsynaptic membrane. So here's another depiction of this. I thought you might want to see this uh, kind of in action. So again, the first step that happens is that uh, nerve impulse comes down the axon. Secondly, calcium comes into the cell. And then when calcium comes in, it's going to cause these synaptic vesicles. So if you'll look at the number three right here, this synaptic vesicle will merge with the cell membrane and then send its contents out into the synaptic cleft. And as you can see here on the postsynaptic neuron, you've actually got binding of the neurotransmitters to receptors on the postsynaptic neuron. And this is how neurons communicate with other cells. They'll send neurotransmitters, and those neurotransmitters will bind to uh, the postsynaptic neuron. Now, a couple of different things can happen here. Sometimes these receptors are part of a ligand-gated channel, as in here. So... If this ligand-gated channel opens, then you're going to see sodium coming in. So sometimes that can happen directly. Now, not all of these receptors are actually ligand-gated channels. So what you might actually have happen is you might actually have a receptor, and I'm just going to kind of try to scrawl one in right here. So you might have a receptor here that has a space for that neurotransmitter, and then when the neurotransmitter binds, it changes shape in such a fashion that it will actually open 
um, membrane channels from the inside. So you can have sort of an indirect opening of channels. Okay, so anytime that you have an increased intensity of stimulus, there's an increased number of action potentials generated. Okay, now there's not an increase in the size or the height of the action potential. So these action potentials in neurons are always going to go from negative 70 to positive 30, back down to negative 70, maybe a little bit further uh, down into hyperpolarization, back down to about negative 90, but they're all going to look the same in terms of their voltage. So how can you, the individual, how can you tell the difference between an intense stimulus versus a weak stimulus if the action potentials are always the same height? Well, this has to do with um, the refractory period that we talked about in the last video. So in the last video, um, I told you that at the beginning of the relative refractory period, when you had just a few channels open, that you could get another action potential started, but it would have to be with a very strong signal. Okay, so if you can start a signal sooner, that means that action potentials can come closer together. So Let's take a look at, there's a neuron, it's going through threshold, it, or, or it may be receiving a stimulus, but it hasn't reached threshold, nothing happens. When you have a stimulus that reaches threshold, then you're going to get action potentials. And so I wanna say that that sort of up and down there, that is sort of a really compressed action potential. You see that that white line is at positive 30, and that blue line is at negative 70. So basically each one of those lines that goes up and down is an action potential going up to positive 30 and down to uh, below negative 70. So maybe for another time period, you don't have another stimulus. And then if you look at the stimulus level itself on the bottom part of the graph, you can see that it's a stronger stimulus. And what's gonna happen there? The action potentials are going to come much closer together in terms of time. And what that means is, how do you tell the difference between a strong stimulus and a weak stimulus the stronger the stimulus, the faster the action potentials come into your central nervous system. Okay, so the next thing that we're going to talk about is graded potential. So we've been talking about action potentials this whole time. We've kind of made reference to graded potentials. Now we're going to get into those in more detail. So the first thing to tell you is that these are produced when ligand, which are chemically gated or mechanically gated channels, open or close. So we talked about some of the different types of channels in a previous video. We talked about leak channels which open at random, voltage gated channels which open in response to voltage, chemically gated channels which open in response to a chemical binding, and mechanically gated channels which open or close in response to some sort of pressure. So graded potentials do not have refractory periods and the reason why they don't have refractory periods is because their channels are either open or closed. So as long as they're receiving their stimulus, as long as some sort of mechanical stimulus is sort of putting pressure on the channel, or as long as the ligand is bound, they're gonna be open. So when do they stop letting sodium in? They're gonna stop letting sodium in when the stimulus stops. So either when the ligand diffuses away or when the mechanical stimulus stops. They're gonna vary in size and we'll go into the reason why in just a moment. So they're, they're gonna vary in size and therefore they're, they're graded. So here's kind of a scenario that I want you to get in your head. So let's say that you've got just one ligand that opens one ligand gated channel. So sodium's gonna come in to that one channel, but it's not gonna cause a very sharp movement of your membrane potential towards threshold. It's only gonna be a very small stimulus and it probably, it almost certainly won't reach any kind of threshold. So let's say that you have five ligand gated channels that are open at the same time. That's gonna move you further up towards stimulus. That's gonna give you a greater depolarizing stimulus, okay? So the reason why these vary in size is because with a small amount of ligand present, you'll have just a few channels open. With a large amount of ligand present, you'll have a much larger number of channels that are open. So 
those are going to be differently sized graded potentials. So again, the size of your graded potential depends on the number of ion channels that are open at a given time. Now these are decremental signals, so they fade out with distance. So if you'll recall that one slide that I went through just a few minutes ago where the sodium came in and that it faded out with distance, that's what decremental means. That you decline, that your signal declines with distance from the stimulus. And we'll see another graphic on this in just a little bit. Okay, graded potentials can vary due to different neurotransmitters. So there are some neurotransmitters that will bind to channels that will let sodium in. These are going to be stimulatory. There are some neurotransmitters, when they bind to a receptor, they actually let potassium out. These are going to be inhibitory neurotransmitters. And again, we'll see an example of that in just a little bit. So again, some ex are excitatory and some are inhibitory. So let's talk about a hyperpolarizing graded signal. So what's going to happen here? This means that there is a greater charge across the plasma membrane compared to your resting potential. Now what I've got on the graph on the right is just a resting membrane potential. But let's say that you have some sort of channel opening, so either a ligand gated channel or a mechanically gated channel that allows potassium out of the cell. So when potassium leaves the cell, when those positive ions leave the cell, it's actually going to drop your resting membrane potential below negative 70. So the inner surface of the plasma membrane is more negative than it is at resting. Now you'll notice that it came back up. The reason why it came back up is because your leak channels are always going to be trying to fix this situation and get you back to your resting membrane potential. So this is what a hyperpolarizing stimulus is going to look like. And so basically um, what this diagram shows right here is where you have a hyperpolarizing stimulus from here to here. And you'll notice again that you're moving further away from zero. So you're moving in a more negative direction. Same thing in the other diagram. So here, this is where your initial stimulus begins and you move away from zero. So you move in a more negative direction. Now, if you're down here, do you think it's going to be easier or harder to get to threshold? The answer is it's going to be harder to get to threshold. And so that means that this signal is going to be inhibitory. It's going to inhibit the start of an action potential. Now, these stimuli occur at the postsynaptic membrane. So this is a postsynaptic potential that is inhibitory, therefore it is an IPSP, an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. And an IPSP is the same thing as a hyperpolarization. Now with a depolarizing signal, you might expect this is something that is just the opposite. So this means if you have a depolarization, there's less of a charge across the plasma membrane. So if we take a look at this, you can see that the resting membrane potential has gone towards zero. So it has risen. Now, is this particular potential going to cause an action potential? The answer to that is no. You can see that it's gone up to negative 60, but it hasn't reached your threshold of negative 55. And so in this case, you can have a depolarizing graded potential that is that does not reach threshold. Now, I want you to imagine this, though. So you've taken your membrane up closer to threshold. So you're almost all the way there. So in this case, it's actually going to make it easier to start an action potential before the stimulus dies out because it's closer to threshold. And because it makes it easier to start an action potential, it's going to be called excitatory. And again, remember, this is something that is happening on the postsynaptic neuron. So this is an excitatory postsynaptic potential or EPSP. Now, there is something that I want to talk about here with an EPSP. This opens chemically gated ion channels. And these ion channels, for some reason, they allow the passage of, of sodium and potassium at the same time. Now, 
the reason why this becomes still depolarizing is that the sodium and potassium, they don't cancel out. And the reason why is sodium passage into the cell is faster than potassium passage out of the cell. And the reason why is because the concentration gradient for sodium is much larger than the concentration gradient for potassium. So sodium comes in faster than potassium leaves. And because of that, this will be an excitatory postsynaptic potential. So these channels are going to be sodium-potassium channels. Now in IPSPs, with your hyperpolarization, one of two things is going to happen. So, um, so let's talk about IPSP for just a second. And I'm sorry, I'm going to have to scroll on here again. So where am I? All right. Let me move down here. So an IPSP. Sorry, I'm trying to write with a mouse and I'm no good at it. So an IPSP, what it's going to do is it's going to let potassium out. And if you let potassium out, then you're going to move your potential downwards. But it can also let chlorine ions in. So if you let a chlorine ion in, that's a negative charge. So when chlorine ions come in, that's still going to lower your stimulus. So an EPSP is sodium potassium channels. So sodium potassium channels. An IPSP can either be potassium or chlorine channels. Okay, so again, in this diagram, you're seeing a couple of different things. You're seeing that an EPSP can move you towards threshold, but doesn't necessarily get you all the way there. And again, remember that an EPSP is the same thing as a depolarization. Okay, so again here with an IPSP, this is a local hyperpolarization, and I guess I should have waited on this channel. I guess I got a little bit eager, but you'll open either potassium, letting potassium out, or chlorine channels, letting chlorine in. And this is how you get an IPSP or inhibitory postsynaptic potential. Okay. Now, no matter what type of potential that you have, your stimulus is going to hit at a very localized region. So just right here is where your stimulus occurs. And only in this area are you getting the opening of channels. That means that ions are going to come in and they're going to spread out. But as these ions come in and spread out, they lower in concentration. And so what you're going to see to the resting potential, if you'll look at the bottom diagram, you're going to see as those um, ions diffuse, you're going to see the signal get weaker with distance on either side of the active area. And so this is the reason why you can have graded potentials. Again, because the greater the active area, the larger the active area, the bigger the signal that you've got, the more sodium comes in and the longer that it takes to die out. Okay, now another thing that I want you to, to realize or to know is that there can be what's called summation of these different EPSPs and IPSPs. So let's get a little bit oriented here. So this, this green arrow, sorry, I was doing that on the wrong monitor. <laughs> so this right here represents, let me see if I can get that working. There we go. This color represents an excitatory synapse, so that's going to be right here. Okay, so here's one. Here's a single excitatory synapse. Again, remember, this area right here, this axon, is the presynaptic neuron. And I want you to remember that contact is happening right here where your synapse is. Okay, so all of these things, all of these graphs right here are occurring with the postsynaptic neuron right here. So that's one excitatory synapse. If we take another look at this, this is another excitatory synapse, which is going to be right here. And you've also got inhibitory synapses, which are going to, and there's an example of that right here. And so what's the difference here going to be? The difference is going to be which neurotransmitter is released and is opening which channels. So an excitatory synapse is going to send a neurotransmitter that will cause a sodium potassium channel to open and cause a depolarization in the receiving or postsynaptic neuron. 
an inhibitory synapse is going to be one that releases a neurotransmitter that opens one of your potassium channels or one of your chlorine channels that causes an inhibitory signal in IPSP. Now, you're not going to have, you're most likely not going to have just one neuron communicating with the other neuron, but just for simplification, let's see that happening over here in your first diagram, in your first diagram. So right here, let's, um, crap, did that again. So right here, right this area, right here. So you're just seeing one excitatory synapse. And so it's sending in a signal right here. And then a little bit later, it sends in a signal right here. But in between the signals, there's been time for those leak channels to get rid of those sodium ions and cause that signal to die out. Now, what happens if these excitatory stimuli come in closer in time? So you have your first excitatory signal come in and it raises your membrane potential to here, but it comes in quickly enough to where the leak channels don't have time to reduce it all the way back down to resting potential. So you start a second graded potential when your membrane is already partially depolarized and that makes it a lot easier to get up to threshold and you start your action potential. Okay, so this is something that's called temporal summation. So two excitatory stimuli that are close together in time are going to add together to a threshold stimulus. So now let's take a look at this third diagram here. So here you've got two different synapses that are acting together. So maybe just one synapse only gets you so far. But you combine the two signals and you can reach threshold and cause an action potential. So basically, here's an analogy that I've got for this. So let's go back over here. So let's say that you throw a pebble in a pond, you're going to cause ripples. Now let's say that you throw two pebbles in a pond and you manage to hit exactly the same spot. Um, just a very short time apart, those waves, those ripples are going to add together to make bigger ripples. Now, with this example, with spatial summation, maybe you've got your pond right here, and you put in, you throw a pebble in right here, and then you throw another pebble in right here at the same time. Now, where these ripples add together, they're going to make larger ripples. And so it's kind of the same concept that two um, excitatory synapses acting together can make a larger signal that's easier to push you towards threshold. So again, this is spatial summation. But the, the picture can get a little bit more complicated because there are not only excitatory signals out there. Sometimes you'll have excitatory and inhibitory signals kind of fighting each other. So here, let's say your inhibitory signal comes in and you can see that you're lowering your potential away from threshold, okay? So that's had time for your leak channels to even it out and come back up to resting potential, okay? Now, your excitatory potential might get you up towards threshold, but inhibitory will drop it right back down. So basically, sometimes these things can cancel out. Um, EPSBs and IPSBs can cancel each other out, especially when you consider that much of the time you have multiple neurons synapsing, multiple presynaptic neurons synapsing with one postsynaptic neuron. And we'll see a, a picture of this. So we're going to take a look at a diagram of multiple presynaptic neurons and one postsynaptic neuron in just a minute. But before we do that, I wanted to take you through spatial summation and temporal summation with the different diagrams. So you'll notice that there aren't any lines on the graph. So what I'm going to try to do is kind of narrate what's going on with this graph as it moves from left to right. So let's take a look at the left, um, at the left situation. So this is going to be spatial summation. And you see where the arrow and number one and the arrow and number two and many uh, where these um, labels are. And so we're going to see one and then another and then many. So that first graded potential wasn't good enough to get to threshold, neither was the second on its own. But when they act together, they can move up to threshold and you get an action potential. Now, with the presynaptic neuron on the left, in a diagram on the left of temporal summation, what you're going to see is you're going to see the presynaptic neuron starting out slowly. It's going to send um, 
graded potentials in slowly. So the first one won't have an effect. The second one won't have an effect, but you'll see as they come closer together that they'll build towards threshold and set off an action potential. So here's one, then another, and then bang, 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 action potential. So this is how temporal, temporal summation occurs. Now there's an analogy that I've got for this. So let's say that you are either parenting or babysitting multiple kids in a house. Okay, so if you're a mom and one kid goes, mom, well, you can ignore that. So uh, they so might say, mom, every few seconds, you're like, I'm studying A and P. Uh, you know, the kid can take care of themselves. All right, but if both kids or three kids yell mom at the same time, you're going to have to go see what's going on. So that's when you swing into your own action potential and you got to take care of business. Now, with it, that's kind of my analogy for spatial summation. Now, temporal summation, you can ignore a kid going mom just once in a while, mom. But if they're like mom, 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 you're going to go what? And there's your action potential. So that's kind of my analogy for spatial and temporal summation. Okay. This is the diagram that shows you multiple presynaptic neurons and multiple post, uh, I'm sorry, and one postsynaptic neuron. So what I want you to notice first is that there are three neurons here that are sending out excitatory signals. And those are gonna be these dots in the red. These are gonna be excitatory neurotransmitters. You've also got presynaptic neurons that are sending out inhibitory neurotransmitters. And those are gonna be sort of those bluish purple type uh, dots. And so these are inhibitory transmitters. And so the first thing that I want to ask you is at the trigger zone, do you think you're going to get more excitatory signal or more inhibitory signal? I would think looking at this diagram that you would have more excitatory signal. For one thing, there are more excitatory neurons than there are inhibitory. But the second thing is these excitatory neurons kind of have an advantage, the one on the very left and the one on the right, the presynaptic neuron one and presynaptic neuron five, they have an advantage in that they are closer to the trigger zone. So there's less distance for their signal to die out before hitting the trigger zone. So I would definitely think that this setup here would result if all five neurons were firing would result in an excitatory signal and an action potential. Okay, so here's the trigger zone that I've got kind of highlighted in different colors here. Now let's take these excitatory uh, neurons number one and number five away and see what happens. Now in this case, you have more inhibitory signal than excitatory signal. And in this case, if just these three neurons are firing, then more than likely you're going to get inhibition of an action potential. It's actually gonna be more difficult to start an action potential in the postsynaptic neuron. So the number of neurotransmitters that are released matters and the location of the neurotransmitter that are released matters. So it's kind of like uh, real estate, location matters. Okay, so let's take a look at sort of a summary of graded potentials versus action potentials. So where do graded potentials occur? In cell bodies and dendrites. Where do action potentials occur? In the axon hillock and the axon. How far can they travel? Well, graded potentials travel only a short distance, usually from the cell body to the axon hillock, which is gonna be between 0.1 to one millimeters. With an action potential, they're gonna be a really long distance. There can be, it can be just a few millimeters, but it can be over a meter. So I want you to think about, um, I want you to think about a motor neuron that runs from your, basically from your L1 down to the most distant muscle in your foot that allows you to move your toe. So that signal, remember that the cell body for that motor neuron is embedded in the spinal cord. And so you're going to have an action potential that, that goes from your spinal cord all the way down to the end of your toes. And that's going to be a pretty long distance. So action potentials can travel a really long distance. Plus, if you really want your mind blown, think about like a blue whale that's, uh, that's over 100 feet long. And think about the, the neuron that gets a signal from its spinal cord to the end of the ends of its flukes. That's going to be a very long way. Okay, so in terms of amplitude or size, graded potentials can be various sizes and they do decline with distance. With action potentials, they're always the same. So remember, always negative 70 up to positive 30, down to negative, uh, down to below negative 70, back up to negative 70. 
and these don't decline with distance because they keep getting renewed in the process of propagation. With graded potentials, what's the stimulus for the opening of ion channels? It's going to be chemical, which is going to be a neurotransmitter, or some sort of other sensory stimulus. Could be pressure, could be light, could be temperature. With an action potential, the stimulus is always voltage. So it's always a voltage that's triggered by a graded potential causing threshold to be reached at the axon hillock. Now, the whole idea with the positive feedback cycle, we're not going to worry about this. We're just going to fade that out. Now, repolarization in a graded potential happens when the stimulus is no longer present. So whether you have a hyperpolarizing signal in IPSP or you have a depolarizing signal in EPSP, once that stimulus goes away, then your leak channels are going to repolarize back to your resting potential. With an action potential, your voltage is what determines when repolarization starts. So repolarization happens when the sodium channels inactivate and the potassium channels open. Graded potentials can have summations. So you can have temporal summation or spatial summation. And these can increase the amplitude or the size of the graded potential. With action potentials, they're either all the way on or all the way off because there's no difference in action potentials. You always go up to positive 30. You always come back down to negative 70 and you're always going to have the same amplitude. It is an all or none phenomenon. And with respect to postsynaptic potentials, you can have excitatory or EPSPs. And again, these move you towards threshold for the generation of an action potential or you can have inhibitory or IPSPs, and these move your membrane potential away from your threshold for your generation of an action potential. And um, with an action potential, um, you've got long distance signaling, that's the nerve impulse. So there really isn't a postsynaptic potential with action potentials because they occur at the axon hillock and move down the axon. Okay, so what is the initial effect of a graded potential? You're going to open channels that allow uh, sodium in and potassium out, or you're going to open channels that allow potassium out or chlorine in. So on the left, you've got a depolarizing signal because, as I said, more sodium is going to come in than potassium goes out. So that's going to be, that's going to move your membrane threshold in a positive direction and move you towards threshold, therefore depolarizing. Now on the right diagram, you've got uh, a channel with potassium being let out. So if that positive ion leaves the cell, then the interior of the membrane becomes more negative. That's going to be hyperpolarizing. If you look at the chlorine channel, if you let a negatively charged ion into the cell, that's also going to drive the charge down. So that's going to be hyperpolarizing. So this is the effect of a stimulus on these channels. With an action potential, first you open the, uh, the sodium channels, then when you get to positive 30, those will inactivate and you'll get an opening of the potassium channels. So how high can your membrane potential go? Um, with a depolarizing signal, you move towards zero millivolts, so you move in a positive direction. With a hyperpolarization, you move away from zero, so you move in a more negative direction. With an action potential, your, um, your depolarization is, is usually going to end at positive 30 with some types of membrane proteins with some types of sodium channels. The sodium channel is going to be slightly structurally different, and that can raise your uh, depolarization up to positive 50. But the vast majority of the time, I want to let you know that the vast majority of the time, neurons have the same type of sodium channels that will cause a depolarization up to positive 30. So anything besides positive 30 is generally going to be an exception. Okay, so what are some factors that can, that can affect how fast that um, an action potential propagates down an axon? One is going to be the axon diameter. So larger diameters send signals faster because 
if you have a larger axon diameter, there's going to be more space or more room for ions to diffuse around internal proteins and vesicles and other structures. So basically, I want you to think about this. Is it harder to move through a really crowded room or is it harder to move through a much less crowded room? It's easier to move through a much less crowded room and it's much easier for ions to move through a less crowded axoplasma. So a larger axon diameter actually means that your propagation speed can go faster. The amount of myelination affects propagation speed. So heavily myelinated axons send signals faster because they do a more effective job of limiting ions from leaking out across the membrane. And temperature affects propagation speed. So every bit of this is actually based on diffusion. When sodium comes into the cell, whether you're talking about a graded potential or an action potential, it is going down a concentration gradient. It's diffusing down a concentration gradient. And so diffusion happens faster at a faster temperature. So um, signals will propagate down an axon faster at a higher temperature. Okay, so let's talk about some of the different types of neurotransmitters. And we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on this. So uh, one type of neurotransmitter is a small molecule transmitter. Acetylcholine is a good example of this. It's a fairly small molecule. Amino acids are fairly small molecules. Biogenic amines are also fairly small molecules. Okay, ATP and other purines are also fairly small. Nitric oxide is really tiny, so this is just NO. Same thing with carbon monoxide. It can act as a neurotransmitter itself. Now, larger neurotransmitters involve neuropeptides. Septi substance P is a good example of this. And so you can see here that it's made of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, uh, uh, 11 um, amino acids. So this is going to be considerably bigger than any of the substances or any of the neurotransmitters that we saw in the previous slide. Enkephalins are also larger, and so are endorphins. So these are going to be, neuropeptides are going to be larger neurotransmitters. So will dynorphins, which basically do the same job as endorphins. And hypothalamic releasing and inhibiting hormones, these are a very important part of the endocrine system, which you'll find, about, find out about in the first portion of AMP2. These hormones are also uh, large hormones that are neuropeptides. Angiotensin II is also a neuropeptide. Now, there's something that's kind of interesting about this. Um, there is an enzyme that converts angiotensin I to angiotensin II called angio angiotensin converting enzyme, or ACE. It's present in lung cells, so your lungs actually convert angiotensin I to angiotensin II. And what's interesting about this right now is that the receptor for ACE actually appears to be the route by which COVID-19 enters respiratory cells. So people who are on ACE inhibitors may well have a little bit of added protection against um, a really bad case of COVID-19. But I'm sorry, that was a bit of a sideline. Angiotensin II is a hormone that causes the body to retain water through a variety of mechanisms. You'll learn those in AMP2, so I don't want to belabor it right now. Um, but it is also a neuropeptide. Cholecystokinin is also a neuropeptide, and you'll learn more about that when you talk about the digestive system. Okay, so these are um, some of the different neuropeptides, where they're found, and if you want to pause this and look at it, that's fine, but I'm not going to read all the way through the, um, I'm not going to read all the way through the, the, through this table because you've probably heard enough of me talking by now. Okay, so the last thing that we're going to cover is neural circuits. And so because neurons can communicate with each other, a neural circuit is a group of neurons that process different, different types of information. And so there are going to be different types of circuits. Now, one thing that I'm going to tell you right away is that a lot of these circuits are dependent on what are called axon collaterals. And so an axon collateral is a branch of an axon. And so here's the really cool thing about axon collaterals. They carry a full strength action potential. So I want you to kind of get this picture in mind. So let's say this is your axon. 
and let's say that you're branching off of it okay and so this would be your axon collateral and your axon just continues on down the way here it doesn't get skinnier it just continues on down the way sorry that's my bad mousing but your action potential is carried by voltage gated channels down here it's also carried by voltage gated channels here now you have the same voltage gated channels that go down the collateral and what this means is that the collateral itself here will carry the same intensity signal as here now with electrical wiring and with cable wiring if you split the cable signal or if you split electrical signal you're going to reduce the amount of current and biological systems don't work like this you can branch out um, axon collaterals because each branch will carry a full strength action potential and this allows for some real flexibility in terms of circuits so there are simple series and diverging converging reverberating and parallel after discharge and so a simple series is basically just going to be where one single neuron leads into another single neuron and we're going to take a look at these other types of of circuits over the next couple of slides so we're going to look at diverging and converging first so a diverging circuit is going to look like this so you can see that you've got um, one neuron that sends signal to two neurons which sends signals to four neurons and so you've kind of diverged your circuit here but uh, one thing to realize is again because you don't have any weakening of signal you're going to have basically four times the signal with the output as you did with the input now you can also have converging circuits where you have basically multiple inputs into one output so a converging circuit will actually sort of compress signal this is something that actually happens in the retina uh, in your eye. Okay, reverberating circuits. To reverberate means to kind of keep on ringing. So if you if you strike a bell with a clapper, it will continue to vibrate or ring, and that's what a ver reverberating circuit does. So you can see that it can kind of go it can kind of go around and around here. So your input goes to a second neuron. The second neuron goes to a third neuron. That third neuron, ha third neuron has an axon collateral but that, that will strike this neuron, which will send signal back here and send signal back here. And so basically, this signal will keep running around and around and around here until you get uh, inhibitory signals that stop it. And so your output neuron actually participates in the fun, can participate in the fun by sending signal back as well as on out. And so basically what happens here is you get one input here and you get repeated signals right here. So one input and then this thing just keeps on dinging your output neuron over and over and over again until an inhibitory signal comes in. And whenever I look at this reverberating circuit, honestly, I kind of get the image of Beavis on Beavis and Butthead going So it kind of goes like that. Sorry for the sound effect. Okay. This is a parallel after discharge circuit. Now, what I want you to notice is this. So one neuron sends a signal straight down, and this will strike the output neuron a first time. Now, here you have an axon collateral that, that sends out a signal to this neuron, sends a signal to this neuron, sends a signal to this neuron. Now, I want you to remember you've got a couple of synapses involved here. One here, a synapse involved here. And so that's going to slow the signal down a little bit. So signal number one will strike from this axon signal number two will strike from this axon and then over on the right you've got one signal and a synapse another signal another synapse and that's basically going to again slow this process down a signal and a synapse right here so what's going to happen is look at this you've got one two and three synapses here you've got one synapse here and you've got two synapses here so this signal comes in first this signal comes in second this signal comes in third and so when your initiating neuron starts a signal it will get to strike your output neuron three separate times so that's what a parallel after discharge circuit can do